Tonight, we're discussing one of the huge issues of the day, something that could have an even greater impact on the world than diseases such as COVID-19, plastic pollution. And our guest tonight has done more than almost anyone to bring this problem to the attention of the world. She is Mandy Barker, FRPS. Hello, Mandy. Hello, thank you very much for having me. Nice to have you with us. Now, of the many horrendous statistics available, I suppose the one that struck me most was this, eight million tons of plastic end up in the sea every year. And if it continues, our oceans will contain more plastic than fish in 30 years time. How has it come to this? Um, it's the over, over consumption and continuous consumption of unnecessary plastic, um, mainly sort of single use plastic, which is um, really got out of control in our kind of throwaway society. Are we even now taking it seriously enough? No, no, there's so much that needs to be done and statistics at the moment are sort of saying that over the next eight years there'll be as much plastic produced as has been produced in the 20th century, which is horrifying. Do you ever feel overwhelmed by the size of the problem? I do. Um, you know, when you re continually reading these different sort of types of statistics, um, it's easy to kind of, um, you know, become overwhelmed, as you say. But um, I think if you look at individual sort of sections and items and, you know, there is a lot of good things being done. Um, you've just got to carry on and, you know, um, have some hope. Well, let's have a look now at a video clip to see just how the plastic problem spreads all over the world. And this is from when you went to the Pitcairn Islands. It's a lot more flexible, isn't it? That one's breadfruit. Is it? Oh, yeah. yeah. That one's breadfruit. Oh, wow. It's a beautiful texture through them. Wow. Yeah. You know, just seeing the different types of stuff that's there. It's amazing what other people's crap that we're getting on all pristine beaches. Yeah. And it, it, it's sad to see and it's sad to know that um, as it breaks down, you know, it's affecting not only the, the fish and, and the, the sea creatures, but also the birds as well. And probably the hermit crabs and the coconut crabs. Yeah. It's sad to see and you know it's kind of not fair in a way that we have to deal with other people's crap. Well now Amanda you've received global recognition for your work which involves traveling the world and picking up all kinds of plastic uh, and using them to make beautiful images. Is your message getting through at all? I think so, yes. I mean, I do get positive response from people who visit my exhibitions. Um, you know, I often leave a book for people to write in um, if it has made them uh, do anything about the issue on a personal level, if it's made them, um, you know, kind of do more than just um, think about the plastic they use on a daily basis. You know, for instance, signing a petition or get involved in a beach clean and more than 83% of people say that the work has, um, you know, kind of made them do something else and it's informed them of the types of plastic that they never realised existed in the sea. Well, let's have a look at one of your images now. Uh, this shows 276 pieces of plastic recovered from the stomach of a 90-day-old albatross chick. Does that make you angry? It does, yeah. Uh, angry and very sad um, to think that you know a stunning sort of creature could you know be ingesting what it thinks is food um, you know being fed by the parent bird that goes out to sea um, mistakenly finding plastic and feeding it to this you know kind of stunning creature um, it's horrific you know I mean the chick ends up by starving because it thinks it's full um, but it's obviously full of plastic and then it just dies Let's go back a bit now um, to your childhood. Were you always fascinated by nature? I was, yeah. Um, that's me on the left with a piece of seaweed and on the right hand side we'd been catching minnows and they were kind of trapped in a jar which I wasn't very happy about. But I always um, had sort of terrapins and tropical fish and 
frogs and newts and I was always fishing in ponds so yeah I was outdoors all the time and you know had a real love of nature. And what about photography how did you get into that? Uh, that was probably in my early teenage years and um, I was walking through a shop a bookshop and I saw a book um, by Don McCullin and on the front cover was the um, picture which probably a lot of people are, are aware of is the shell-shocked US Marine um, you know from the Vietnam War and there was just something about that image that just held me um, and I wanted to sort of know more about it so I got my parents to buy me the book for Christmas and I just sat and looked at the I can remember looking through the book kind of every night and you know uh, that was that when I realized that photography could actually do something it could you know take you to a place that you couldn't necessarily get to and it could educate you about things. And of course these images are shortlisted for Taylor Wessing. Um, let's have a look now at your first project with an environmental theme uh, using multi-exposure film. What yes. can you tell us about this one? Uh, this was actually when I was studying photography on a, an HNC course and basically it's a book cover for Rachel Carson's Silent Spring and I wanted to you know try and represent the detrimental effect to birds eggs and how the, the eggshells thinned from the pesticides that were sprayed onto the fields um, so you know different interpretations of that but that, that's when I realized that I could try and do something um, you know to give a message and information about a problem. And of course, before you started traveling all over the world, your local beach, Spurn Point near Hull, I gather was something of an inspiration for you. It was. I mean, that's the first time that I really connected with plastic in the sea. Um, you know, I used to visit as a child and, you know, collect driftwood and shells like most people did. And then uh, over the years, I began to revisit and see sort of waste washing of uh, predominantly plastic. And that kind of coincided with me doing a photography course and I realised that, you know, this was the issue I wanted to represent. And now we can move on to your project called Indefinite, which really started a pattern, recovering individual objects that look pretty, but make a serious point. Yes, these are, um, you know, different materials of plastic that take different times to degrade in the ocean. Uh, you know, plastic bags and fishing line, and basically, I just wanted the caption to be very simple. I didn't want to have lots of information to read. So as you can see, it's one year or one to three years. And then at the end, um, the title of the project called Indefinite, it finished with the um, picture of polystyrene, which- well, We uh, can go on to that actually, because the next one shows, what, 10 to uh, 30 years. Yeah. Um, and how do you know this, by the way? How can you be so sure? At the time, this series was done in 2010 and um, I emailed scientists and I went on the internet to find out information and double check everything. I never sort of, you know, nothing is guessed. Um, you know, it's all based on what scientists have told me. So in this case, it formed a timeline to, to show, you know, the different amounts of time. But of course, now we know that um, all plastic ever produced, unless it's been burnt, uh, still exists. Um, you know, out there. So in effect, all these things are now indefinite, which wasn't known at the time. And as you say, if we go on to the next one, um, they have an indefinite life, hence the name of your project, uh, Indefinite Shelf Life. It is incredible, isn't it? Yes. I mean, as you can see, you know, the base of a plastic bottle there, the green uh, image, 450 years, it was estimated. Uh, and I realised when I was taking these photographs, um, the objects I was photographing almost began to take on the, the idea that the um, the creatures, it looked like the creatures that they were actually affecting. Um, so that was kind of something that I didn't plan. It was just, as I was actually photographing things, they just seemed to, seemed to look like faces or fish or, you know, uh, urchins. And let's face it, they look very, very attractive in many cases, which is why fish and mammals are attracted to them. They do. I mean, this is done on purpose because um, originally I did photograph things how I found them on the shoreline. I tried to make them interesting in a documentary style approach, but I realised that people didn't really, it didn't really hold their attention. Um, you know, people see waste everywhere at the side of motorways or whatever. And I realised that if I took the objects um, back to the studio and photographed them on a black background um, out of context, uh, they took on this kind of uh, beauty which drew people in, um, you know, they were attractive um, and then they read the message of what they actually represent. In a way, your 
vying for attention, aren't you? Because people are bombarded with messages, particularly about global warming and the environment. It's, it's how to cut through, isn't it? It is, and this seemed to work. Um, you know, people seem to have a long lasting memory of the images and the pictures they've seen, um, as opposed to, you know, the documentary style approach. So that was something that I ran with because I realized it seemed to affect people and, you know, hold their attention, as I say. Well, as you were hinting, images are extremely powerful, especially when they're projected in, in this very clear way. Um, but let's move to some more moving images. Um, another video clip where you explain your approach to your work. And here, of course, you're using a camera which is made out of plastic waste, which is rather neat. I just hope people will, that look at my images will just think about the issue. Um, you know, I try and create these images to look beautiful so people are attracted to them. And then when they read what the caption represents, they're then shocked as to where the plastics come from, what it is, and what I'm trying to say in the image. So I just hope in some way it might have made people think about, you know, their daily habits, you know, refuse single-use plastic, um, choose alternatives. Tell us about your plastic camera then. Yeah, well, I have it here. Um, so this was made um, by um, a photography tutor that I used to have and his brother at Hopewell Studios. And basically, this is a chicken feeder that I found in the North Sea. This um, is actually used that way up and it's filled with water to feed chickens. Um, there's like a chopping board on there. There's different wheels. Um, all these different components have been collected from nine different countries around the world. Um, and I don't know if you can see here, there's actually, it's, this is decoration, but it's a recycling tag. And this was actually found in the stomach of a bird on, on Lord Howe Island. So I wanted to create something, um, you know, it's all about the process really. It's not so much about how brilliant the images look at the end, but the actual fact that plastic is almost taking its, its own picture. Um, you know, you kind of look through the back here, which is a medium format back um, film and um, you know the images sort of travelled through the debris itself to take photos of the debris. Um, the final piece was from Henderson Island which was this little black uh, wheel in the middle uh, and that's when I, I attached the final piece and then I took the photos on Henderson Island so I, I took this all the way um, you know, to the middle of the South Pacific to uh, to have fingers crossed it works. And, uh, <laughs> amazing, amazing story. Well, of course, it does take pictures. We can see one now. Uh, not bad either. So, is this Henderson? This is Henderson Island, yeah, looking down South Beach when it's actually being cleaned up. Yeah. Now, of course, your work's now been published in more than 40 countries in national newspapers and magazines. You've won all sorts of awards. Uh, you've worked with Greenpeace, spoken at international forums but still the plastic just keeps on coming. Uh, how do you keep your spirits up? Um, probably through people that are trying to, trying to push a way forward, you know, with the plastic issue. There are a lot of people out there and a lot of, you know, people from the young generation now that are trying to make headway because, you know, they're the ones that are going to be left with this problem. Um, you know, and it can be even the, the you know, two sisters, um, that actually campaign to get rid of plastic McDonald's toys, um, you know, and, you know, there's people all over the world, too many to name, that are actually, you know, really making headway with bans and, you know, petitions. Now, the next image shows objects recovered from the stomachs of albat albatross chicks. What have we actually got here? Well, as you can see, it's a, a variety of single use um, objects, which is a huge problem. Um, you know, that this was actually a bag of things given to me at a conference and I just asked the lady if I could borrow it and just literally photographed it in my hotel room. And this image has kind of been around the world and been published in many, many, um, you know, different magazines, etc. Uh, the Epsom ink cartridge is the ink cartridge that I use in my printer, which is something that really struck a chord with me. The fact that a bird has swallowed an inkjet cartridge is, is something that I, I just couldn't get over. And when I saw this bag and this collection of items I was just um, you know so shocked this is these are the things that drive me on to create new work now research plays a really important part in your work doesn't it 
It does. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I record everything in sketchbooks and notebooks. Um, you know, it might give me ideas as to the composition or the way to present something, or it might be the science that I've read and, you know, I kind of think of the way that that could be um, translated into something visual. Uh, the left-hand side here, this is, uh, this was actually inspired by a photographer, Edward Meyerbridge, um, and the series Locomotion, because I was going to um, use some children's bath toys that had actually fallen from a container ship in the North Pacific and here you can see a turtle. There was actually a duck, a beaver and a frog. Um, but I only had four items and I wanted to try and create this uh, mass illusion of the 28,000 plus toys that were lost um, from this container. So this is an idea of, you know, initial, initial ideas of how I went about it. But there's a lot more involved to your work than taking images, obviously. Um, but what about this next one? You call it turtle soup. Yes, this is um, the resultant image of the sketchbook page. And this is, you know, trying to represent the 28,000 bath toys that were um, thrown into the sea. And basically I photographed them at different angles, almost like sort of a sequence as if they were swirling around in the ocean. And then this is put together in a, a composite image. And there are, there is a duck, a beaver and a frog hidden in there as well. Just emphasising your point about images being so powerful, Every, everyone knows that marine creatures can easily mistake fishing lines for food, but when you see an image like this, they really do look similar, don't they? Yep, yeah. uh, on the left this is monofilament fishing line uh, and it's been rolled into a ball by the tide that's kind of just continually rolled it in and out. And on the right hand side are fish eggs, so you know in terms of colour and more or less similar size, you know it's not hard for wildlife to mistake plastic for, um, you know, food. And this next one you call bird's nest soup. Yeah, this is following on from that, these nest-like balls. Um, I created a composition similar to um, a shoal of jellyfish and hopefully that gives the feeling of them swirling around in the ocean. But of course, it's plastic uh, fishing line, which is a huge problem. Uh, and if you ever wondered what happens to your tube of toothpaste, we've got one very prominent in the next image. Uh, extraordinary image, this one. How did you do this image? Um, this is a detail of a larger image and basically in a similar way that I do all the soup style images is um, I have a black velvet background and I sprinkle randomly the very small pieces and take an image. And then I scatter the medium sized pieces uh, and then the larger pieces and then I sandwich these together using Photoshop. Um, but I don't use any sort of manipulation, it's just literally to layer the images and somehow um, the size give this kind of depth and suspension that I'm after. It's very effective. Uh, now the opposite to this of course is this next one which is very uniform in the way it's presented. What was the point of doing it this way? This was um, the final image in the series of soup images. The earlier ones had been this, these random sort of compositions of suspension, but this is almost like a full stop. It's like the end of the series and it was to reflect more than 500 plus pieces of plastic that had been found in an albatross. Um, and I wanted to reflect a kind of compact composition as if the plastic had been compactly, um, you know, existing in the stomach of the albatross. So it's a compact arrangement to represent that in a different way to the earlier suspension ones. So when somebody sees this and they think, oh, how pretty to begin with, you then hope the message gets through when they read the caption or whatever. Is that the idea? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like with all my work, um, you know, the caption is very important. You know, it goes with the image um, and people, as you say, are initially drawn in and then they read what it represents and hopefully they're, you know, shocked. I was going to say in a way you want to shock them, don't you? I do, yeah. Um, yeah, I have a lot of different reactions. You know, in, in my exhibitions, sometimes people are moved to tears, you know. Um, and, you know, I think I don't want to make everyone cry, but um, if I can move them emotionally, um, you know, a little bit, then, um, you know, that's my aim, really, because I think that then, you know, makes people think and want to take action. And if you move them emotionally, yes, they may be moved to actually do something. Mm -hmm. um, what I like about your work is you choose a different way of presenting things for each project to attract attention. And these represent snowflakes, don't they? 
Yes, this is called Every Snowflake is Different. And this was produced around Christmas time because I wanted to engage people with the idea of, you know, a snow flurry. Um, and I collected these from a nature reserve over probably two afternoons. Um, and basically every snowflake has a different molecular structure. So I wanted to collect different pieces of white plastic that had, uh, you know, were different objects really to relate to that. And here's a detail from that image. It's all very cleverly done. How long would it take you to do an image like this? Um, probably that one, um, it can take a week, um, mainly because, you know, I want to be happy with it and I can maybe shuffle the layers around um, just so that they fit better. Um, yeah, I just, you know, it's just my personal um, you know, approval of the final sort of composition. But, uh, you know, they can take, some take an afternoon, some are very quick and, you know, some take a bit longer. And of course, you were awarded your RPS fellowship because you had an exhibition in RPS House in Bristol. But prior to that, you were awarded an RPS bursary. Uh, what did you use that for? The bursary was used to travel from um, Tokyo to Hawaii. And it was a year and three months after the uh, tsunami in Japan. And scientists wanted to do research relating to um, when the plastic left land, because they knew the plastic left land on March the 11th, 2011. Um, so I sailed on a yacht with scientists and educators who were doing this research um, on a 32 day voyage across the North Pacific through the tsunami debris field. And I used the bursary uh, to do that. So you were traveling with scientists, gathering information, gathering lots of plastic. What did you do with it all? Well, the plastic was for the scientists. I couldn't have, have any of the plastic. So what I had to do was when it was collected, and this is a trawl here that's just sieved from the surface of the ocean. Um, I had my black velvet on the, the, the yacht table um, and I had to photograph it, it within the yacht in very rough conditions and you know, really um, 30 degree sort of heat uh, below. Um, so it was very difficult because things were rolling about, but I photographed every piece of plastic that was brought on board the yacht over 32 days and then put them together to create a series shoal um, because it was reminiscent of me being on the yacht and looking down and seeing these most amazing shoals of fish and dolphins and um, whatever followed the boats. What did uh, they think of you getting out your black velvet going down below and photographing? Um, well, I think that they knew, they knew uh, the type of work I did. Um, I guess it's interesting for people to see in practically how it works, but, um, you know, I often got in the way and, yeah, and then I wanted a large fishing boy bringing down to photograph and take up and all that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I guess it was interesting for them to see me doing that. Do you think you could talk to scientists on their own terms? Um, well, on a certain level, yeah, obviously I'm not a scientist, so I couldn't get into, into depth, but I, I've uh, learned a lot over the years and I think I could hold a pretty good conversation. Hold your own. Okay, the next one's in Hong Kong, uh, which shows the extent of the problem there. I mean, what goes through your mind when you come across a scene like this? Just how on earth you could ever clean it up and also reminiscent that people there said that this is just on one tide. You could clear it all up and then a week later it could be the same um so you know it's just that this ongoing um you know influx of plastic into the oceans which is just unbelievable I mean, on this particular beach uh in a certain place um it was 12 feet deep from the base of the uh beach to to the height of the the plastic and uh, styrofoam especially that was you know littering that beach I'm intrigued where you get your ideas from. Um, and the next one was from the lighter on the left hand side because it has a dolphin on it. Um, and that resulted in this project, didn't it? It did, yes. Uh, I was in Hong Kong, I was invited to speak there at a youth conference. And at the same time, I was looking at the beaches in Hong Kong and um, you know, decided to make a Hong Kong soup series. And as you say, at the lighter at the left hand side, it had a dolphin on it. And at that time I was on the shore um, being told about um, the pink dolphin, which was nearing extinction. I think there were only 80 left uh, in the world and they were just out to sea from where I was stood. So I thought it made sense to collect all the lighters that were on that particular beach and create a pod of dolphins almost from the lighters. Which is which what I we, did. we can see that now. Lots and lots of lighters. Mm -hmm. 
incredible. Now, question for you. What are nurdles? Nurdles are pre-production pellets of plastic. So these tiny little, almost cylinders that are about five millimetres. Um, and nurdles make all plastic products. They're melted down, so, you know, moulded into all different um, items. This is a nurdle spill in Hong Kong, one of the biggest nurdle spills they had. So basically container loads of these nurdles fell from the container and split open during a storm. Uh, and as you can see, littered the beaches like snow. Um, and it was a huge problem um, to, you know, first of all, acknowledge, get the problem acknowledged by um, people in Hong Kong and by the company to actually do something to clear it up. Although they're small, they're, they're most detrimental to plastic because they absorb all the pollutants from the ocean. Of course, you use uh, major events to highlight your cause. Uh, and one spectacularly successful one was about football uh, using the World Cup. Um, tell us about that one. Yes, this project was called Penalty. And what I did was I put a call out on social media for people to um, send me a football. If they found a football on the beach or in the ocean, it had to have been in the ocean. Um, and I started to get uh, photographs sent to me from all over the world, which was pretty amazing. And I thought, well, if I get 30, I could create quite an interesting picture. Um, and they, they kept sending me pictures and then um, they started posting with them from all over. So I had like sand and water pouring out of the, the bottom of packages sometimes. And then um, I had this man in Scotland that, um, you know, he said he found like 30 and I was a bit suspicious. And then he sent me them on email and then um, it grew and grew until he, he had 228. Um, and I had to drive up to Scotland in a small van to collect all these footballs to photograph and um, he, he turned out he was a coastal ranger so he was you know looking after the beaches anyway but uh, but yeah that was pretty amazing. <laughs> and here are some of the individual balls you received from all over the world I mean it doesn't matter where you look is it they're there? No I mean they're from all over the world you know uh, from Guadeloupe, Singapore, um, there's balls from the Olympics, from uh, 1973 Mexico World Cup, um, you know, replica balls from all different European games and you name it, they're, they're there. <laughs> and this next one shows 769 footballs from 144 different beaches in 41 different countries and islands. So yet again, we've got a lovely image here with a very serious point. Yes, I mean, this is the, the grand total of all the, the footballs I got and managed to photograph. And yeah, you know, um, at the time of the World Cup, then um, it was really good that this was shown because this is a global um, collection by members of the public around the world. So it's not me collecting the plastic. It was actually, you know, um, a collaborative um, uh, help uh, and image in the end. So that was really good because it's... Uh, it's about education, isn't it, really? Yeah, and by people being involved in collecting, um, you know, they're, they're kind of understanding the problem and, you know, wanting to be involved. And these are school children from all over the world, aren't they? Yes, I mean, these school children were in Texas and the, their teacher sent me these photos because they'd seen my image online and seen it on the news. On It was on CNN News um, on a programme during the World Cup. And they were inspired to go and recover all these old footballs from a local park and uh, a wasteland area. And they created their own penalty series on the school field. So I'm nice. always getting these sorts of things in. It's really nice to see that, you know, um, you know, it does help in the curriculum. And the next project followed on from scientific research, which showed that plankton are ingesting microplastics in the marine environment. They are. Um, this project is called Beyond Drifting, Imperfectly Known Animals, and it's about plankton. When I originally started the project, um, these images on the left-hand side from uh, Plymouth, these were in the lab and they were doing tests within the lab. But I'll, as I started doing the work, um, it was found in the natural environment that plankton were ingesting plastic, which was quite ironic. And on the right-hand side is a sample of um, toothpaste that was sieved through a fine sieve. Uh, microplastics that's you know the type of microplastics that end up in the ocean were there. Amazing well let's go through some of your weird and wonderful images now as you talk about them. Yes so basically this project is based on um, John Von Thompson who was um, a scientist in the 1800s in Ireland 
and he was um, a pioneer in discovering plankton. So I went back to where he collected plankton in the 1800s and I collected plastic from the same places. And I created these plankton-like slides from using this plastic and from moving uh, the pieces of plastic um, on the velvet and also overlaying images. This was actually done on film. Um, and I used an old camera where the film actually got stuck in the back of the camera um, and several images were um, exposed onto the one frame, which uh, gave, again, uh, this kind of specimen, scientific specimen type feel. They look very attractive, don't they? Again, yeah. I mean, this goes right through my work. It's to try and draw the viewer in and question what they're looking at. Uh, and in this case, this is a pram wheel, um, <laughs> but made to look like moving plankton. I actually moved the, pla the pram wheel and the plastic in the same way that the plankton moves um, to try and give this uh, feeling. Very effective. And then, of course, you presented the images and notes in a book, um, which was designed to look like a very old science book from, the eight, from about 1800. Very effective. Yes, uh, I kept, you know, the mould and things like that. And I wanted it to look like a real old book. I wanted people to look it up and think they were looking at science. And then when they get to the back of the book, the index here, um, they can see that they're actually looking at plastic that's been found in the same place as plankton was in the 1800s. And you can see the plastic that's been used to create each, Im each image. And we should say that this was voted one of the top 10 photography books of 2017. Um, now, your next project was on Henderson Island. Tell us a bit more about that one. Yes, uh, this was a true expedition in all sense of the word. Um, so that one of the most remotest places on the planet, as you can see, it's right in the middle of the South Pacific. It took us, um, well, it took nearly kind of six days to get, six, seven days to get there. Um, and it's uninhabited. It's one of only two coral atolls in the world. And it has endemic species that exist nowhere else on the planet. And East Beach on Henderson Island has been named by scientists as the most plastic polluted beach uh, on the planet, which is why the team went. Uh, and again, along with scientists who were doing, you know, um, pioneering work in um, sort of plastic um, research on the island, um, people filming underwater, which you saw at the beginning of uh, the interview, uh, lots of people doing lots of different things, uh, but I went to photograph the plastic and produce a series uh, related to my experience and, you know, well, we can see some of those images now. You call them eclipses. Yes, this is from, I created three different series from Henderson because I wanted to try and engage, engage three different audiences. One was the homemade camera. This is lunacy, which is basically based on the amount of fishing related debris and fishing buoys that were on the island. So these are fishing buoys um, projected, um, used as projections. And then I used the objects of plastic that I found on the island to put in front of the projection to create an eclipse um, and the plastic behind is moving plastic in the background. So these are actually single uh, images but they've been set up as projections um, and here you can see lots of different things. Uh, different um, objects that have been used which you, I think you'll see on the next slide. So basically it's a run of eclipses. This is a soldier that was used um, in one of the eclipses and it's projected with one of the uh, patterns from the fishing boys. And this next one is odd but strangely beautiful. This was found in a cave on Henderson Island and it's just a lump of melted plastic. I don't know what it is, I don't know what's been melted but I found it just like that uh, and it almost looks to me like a weeping man or something like that or somebody hanging the head in shame. Uh, surrounded by all this plastic that's uh, washed up on Henderson. And what have we here? These are the different plastic objects that I found on Henderson and I use these objects to eclipse the image onto the fishing boys. Uh, so these are all manner of things, you know, plastic toys, sunglasses, single-use plastic items. And Henderson Island is more than 5,000 kilometres from the nearest major landmass. So if you think that these have travelled for, you know, um, 5,000 kilometres. Uh, it's pretty shocking to see what's ended up there. And here you are at work in the field. 
Um, yes, this is, um, these are containers that have been bitten by sharks or turtles. In fact, we can see in the next one, uh, the fact that they have been bitten. Um, it is appalling. In fact, if you look at the next one, the detail from the image, you can see quite clearly where they've bitten into the plastic. Yeah, you can see the teeth marks there and, you know, shards of plastic that have got teeth marks in. So, um, you know, some, some have been ingested, of course, but then, you know, some are... Uh, and then the bigger picture, more than 25 different countries, 45 different brands are shown here. Yeah, for more than 45 major brands uh, were found on the island, you know, imprinted into the plastic. And that's just the ones that were found with, you know, full imprints on. Um, there will be many more that are not, of course, and from 25 different countries. Um, so all this plastic, you know, swelling around in the ocean, um, you know, obviously it doesn't come from this island because it's uninhabited and there's nothing lives there apart from endemic species. So to have all this deposited onto there is, you know, horrific. Well, I talked about your work being in newspapers and magazines all over the world, but it's also been exhibited in more than 40 countries from Inner Mongolia to the UNHQ. This one though, this outdoor exhibition is in Gexto in Spain. Uh, so it might be interesting for people to see what your suitcase is like when you come home, full of plastic. That often happens. Uh, this was actually uh, on a holiday, which, um, you know, I couldn't, um, I can never turn away from a particular, um, you know, plastic filled beach, unfortunately. Um, so I actually ditched my clothes and towels and donated them. And um, my suitcase came home looking like that. Yeah. What does your family think when you do this? Um, I think they're used to it now. Um, <laughs> you know, I think if I didn't do that, I think they'd be a bit worried. So there's always something and I'm always stuffing things in other people's uh, suitcases. So, yeah. Okay, well, we're opening up for questions soon, so please start typing in any questions you'd, you'd like for Mandy into the chat bubble at the bottom of the screen. But let's end our chat with a final clip from Henderson Island. As a marine biologist, my role is to document the extinction of species and the decline of their habitat and the damage that's being done. And that's a really hard reality to face. I absolutely believe that regardless of whether the battle is won or lost, go, we should not wave the white flag. And that's what keeps me going. You do not abandon the sinking ship. You fight on until the very end. So don't raise the white flag. Um, right, now time for questions. So do type them in. We've got some coming already. So Mandy, what happens to all the plastic you photograph? Um, I keep most of it. Um, I do have a lot of storage areas, including a friend's garage, uh, my greenhouse, my uh, own small garage. Um, in, in case the penalty project, um, some of the footballs that were still inflated and usable went to Africa, to kids in Africa. So that was a real positive reuse. Um, if I didn't keep the plastic I have, most of it would go into landfill, I'm afraid. So, um, you know, I do have a big collection which I use in exhibitions and, uh, you know. Okay, next question. Do you think we will ever win the war on plastic? I certainly hope so. Um, but, you know, countries and governments have to come together um, and it has to be a global effort. Um, it does seem sometimes, um, you know, really, really difficult, but, you know, at the same time, there's so many people trying to do so many positive things that hopefully the younger generation as well really seem to take things on board and are really bothered um, about doing things and they're, you know, setting up lots of initiatives. So I really hope that we can win this in the end, yeah. Now you told us Henderson is the one place on earth where there's the most plastic uh, but where, the next, que next question says, is the place that uses the most plastic, produces the most plastic? Where in the world is that? The US currently is the biggest plastic polluter. Yeah. Right. Uh, has social media helped you to get your message across? Definitely, yeah. Because when I first um, produced the soup series, um, I was lucky enough to be mentioned in a couple of awards. But I think the main um, 
sort of platform that got my work seen was um, uh, it was somewhere in Italy it was like a, a kind of a cultural website and um, email magazine type of thing and they sort of shared it and it just went viral uh, in 2012 and it went all over the world and I got asked to to appear in you know magazines and publications all around the world from that so yeah without um, their social media from that particular platform um, it probably wouldn't have got easily as seen as it did. Next question is how do you fund these trips? Um, well it's been a long hard slog um, you know I've been doing this for 10 years nothing else but marine plastic in the beginning I had to um, you know I worked as a graphic designer so I substituted uh, my, you know I had to earn extra money with that um, but I'm lucky enough to have been sponsored by National Geographic and you know I've got sort of minimal awards um, but basically now I make um, funds from publications and exhibitions and commissions so uh, what has shocked you the most in all your projects um i think initially when i went to hong kong that was a huge shock because whilst i'd collected plastic from around um the uk scotland and various places where i didn't have to travel too far to uh, although there's masses of plastic on the beaches and they were, you know, it didn't overlap each other and stack up in, into such huge depths that I saw in Hong Kong. I mean, that was on another level. The styrofoam and uh, polystyrene there, which is obviously necessary to keep things cool being in a hot country, uh, and food takeaway sort of containers was just something I'd never sort of seen. Have you had any problems with the companies that produce the plastic? Any pressure applied to you? I haven't, no. Um, you know, I do try and show uh, images that show various companies, you know, as I find them. I don't particularly want to target a specific company because I think it's a global problem and all there's a lot of companies, companies that are responsible. Um, but if I happen to find, you know, a certain type of object from that company and I, I continually find it on beaches, you know, around the world or on, in the UK, then I will make an image of that because that's something that stood out to me and that there is obviously a lot of that around and I want to make a point about that. Do you have any exhibitions planned, COVID allowing, uh, in 2021? I have an exhibition at the moment in Singapore. It's part of um, mm. National Geographic's Planet All Plastic uh, World Tour. And they've um, done a really good um, sort of darkened room, which has highlighted um, a lot of my work is in there in this darkened room. And there's a, there's a plastic display with, um, you know, kind of little cabinets and display cabinets of plastic that they found in Singapore that they've put there to, to highlight my work. And I think that's on until March 2021. Anything else planned for next year? Um, it, COVID permitting, um, I've had a lot of things that have been on hold this year, which hopefully will happen next year. Um, but if you look on my website, I'm continually uh, exhibiting all the time. In September, I had 11 exhibitions in nine different countries. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, it's ongoing. There are, you know, lots of things that kind of come up, come up. <laughs> Right, you've been photographing plastic for 10 years. Will you ever stop? No, I don't think I can. Um, you know, it really got under my skin. The issue is just, you know, getting more and more out of control and there's more and more things coming to light, you know, specific things that are being affected, um, specific problems. And I want to highlight those problems and let people know, you know, that, you know, um, so, you know, even car tyres, you know, where, where does the plastic on the car tyre go? You know, that when you work, you get them worn down and you have to get new tyres, then, you know, I didn't even realise that that could be a problem. And it's those sorts of things that I think people need to be aware of. Do you have a studio? I do have a studio uh, now, very recently. Um, I'm just about to move into it, um, which will be really good because normally I've been working in the house, so... I'm lucky enough to be able to have, um, to have a space now to properly uh, work and store some of my plastic. How can we encourage supermarkets to use even less plastic? Um, well, some supermarkets are doing better than others. Obviously, COVID's got a bit in the way of that, but... Um, you know, it's like with everything, we have to petition, you know, like lots of people have been... Um, 
sort of collecting the plastic that's left over from the vegetables and the food packaging and taking it back to the shop and putting it on the checkouts. There's been certain days to do that. Um, you know, for example, crisp packets, you can't recycle those. People have posted crisp packets back in the letterboxes. Uh, and these things that get attention in the media, you know, all help. But at the end of the day, you know, it's signing petitions, trying to get the government to, uh, you know, put legislation in place to stop the overconsumption of unnecessary single-use uh, packaging. When big brands see their products in your images, do they ever contact you? I haven't been contacted directly, but I did. I have commission. I have done some commissions that have had major brands in the images, and there haven't been favourable um, responses to that. Uh, that's been filtered back to me through um, through companies. But I never do it to for it to be an attack. I do it to be a positive because in the end, I hope it can be turned into a positive by the fact that you know, a certain brand is littering, you know, around the world, then hopefully that will make them, you know, want to do something about it and want to be seen in a better light. It's only ever for a positive, uh, you know, end. What are we like in the UK and how do we compare to other countries? Uh, well, um, we can do so much more. The, the thing that we need in the UK, first of all, is the return deposit scheme for plastic bottles. I mean, that's a huge problem. You know, they're found in beaches all around the country, like so many. Uh, Scotland next year will do a return deposit scheme, and I just really wish we could follow them. Uh, in Australia, it's proven that it works. You know, I think in, um, I think it's in southern Australia, they have the return deposit. This is where you pay a little bit more um, when you buy a bottle of plastic bottle of drink, and then when you return the bottle, um, you, know, you get the money back. And in Australia, I think it's 2.5% of bottles are now found on beach, as opposed to on the west side of Australia, it's still 13 and a half that don't have the return deposit scheme. So it does actually work. And this has been something that the government have been planning to do for many years and it's still not uh, happened. Do you ever collaborate with other photographers? I haven't actually, no. Um, you know, maybe that's something you know, I could think of in the future, but not at the moment, no. What gives you hope? Uh, as I've mentioned before, the younger generation, um, the fact that they can see, you know, what's going to be in their lifetime. I mean, plastic's not a bad thing. It's just the way it's disposed of inadequately and, you know, the way it's littered and the way it enters the oceans. And, you know, if they can see that and want to do something about it you know it's got to be a positive thing uh, for the planet and for their futures anybody watching this is there one thing you could advise them to do which would help stop buying unnecessary plastic if you can go to the supermarket and you can buy say a pepper singly on its own without a pepper in a bag um you know you, you're rejecting that plastic packaging and if people don't buy the plastic then the manufacturers aren't going to keep, you know, producing it. And all we can do is stop buying unnecessary plastic. Um, and we have to, you know, liaise with the design, the manufacturer and, you know, companies to produce something more sustainable. Well, there we are. Mandy Barker, it has been absolutely fascinating and illuminating to hear you talk about the problem of plastic pollution and the extent of the problems. I assume you're going to keep going forever? As long as I can, yeah. Well, plastic's going to be around for hundreds of years, so, and I've got piles of the stuff here, so I'm never going to run out of, uh, um, you know, things to use. And I have many ideas for, you know, the next several projects. So, um, no, I'm not ever going to stop, I don't think. Well, the very best of luck, and it's been great to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Not at all. It's been really lovely to have you. And I'd also like to thank our production team, Andy Moore, LRPS, and Stuart Wall, ARPS. And we have one more event for you this year in the Distinctions Talks live series, Thursday the 3rd of December with Steve Smith, FRPS. Steve will be showing us his award-winning images from Cuba and elsewhere. And here's one example. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for being with us. For now, though, it's goodbye from the Royal Photographic Society.